Lord, Father, we love you so much. We are so blessed to be able to come together as a fellowship, to be able to worship you, to learn of your word. May our hearts freely worship you as we lift up our hands in joy and celebration of what, Jesus, you have done for us in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
I come out of agreement with the lie that you have left me on my own. I am not alone. I come out of agreement with the worry and the fear I've come to know. They won't have a hold on me. Protector, you never, never, never let me go. You said you wouldn't leave me and you won't. You're by my side. Protector, I come into agreement with the truth that you are who you say you are i can trust your heart i commit to agreement with what heaven has declared over my life because i know that you fight for me protect us you never 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 let me go you said you wouldn't leave me and you won't. You're right by my side. Protect us. You hide me in the shadow of your wings. Your presence is my peace, my covering, my song in the night. Protect what the words are to this song. Jesus is your protector. He's your refuge. I don't know what storm you might be in today, but you need to come out of the storm and you need to come into the presence of Christ. So as we go back into this song and sing, I want you to remember who Jesus is, what Jesus provides for you, what he provides for all of us. No weapon, no worry will prosper against you. This is amazing to think about, church. Amazing. No weapon, no worry will prosper against me. No darkness, no evil will tease or torment me. No weapon, no worry will prosper against me. No darkness, no evil will tease or 
There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this agony, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing next to me, there was another in the water, holding back the steam. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears a burden, there's another died for me. There's a the dead beneath the water. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the water holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding of how I set me free? There is a grave that holds no body. And now the power can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls came in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between
There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. Come with me in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be. Mystery he lavishes on us as deep cries out to deep. Oh, how desperately he wants us. The things of earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun. Taken for the sake of all mankind, salvation is in his blood.
as the clouds he rides swing low lift up the sound as he makes our praise his throne filling this place with your grace and your mercy and your love. We sing out to you. Our whole soul sings to you. Everything, Lord. We just are so grateful for who you are and that you are here saturating this place. Go before us today as we are about to receive your word. Speak through pastor. Minister to him. Fill him with your love, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. for telling others about Jesus.
I don't know why they didn't shoot me. The interrogations are the only time I am out of solitary. I am losing hope and fear I have been forgotten. I recite Bible verses to myself, but the words are getting harder and harder to remember. I can handle the torture, the starvation, but I desperately need my Bible. Every day I pray over and over for God to give me a Bible. Now I have my chance. The interrogations have ended and the guards trust me to go into the jungle to gather firewood. Working as fast as I can, I will collect two days worth of firewood. I'll bring one bundle back and leave the second bundle in the woods. This is what I need to do. It is very risky, but God is answering my prayer. I will risk everything to have a Bible. I don't want to leave my wife, but I have to or she will be in danger. Leaving her is so hard. God has answered my prayer. I have a Bible, but I must be careful. They found my Bible, but I would not give up. I will bring in more Bibles. I will read God's word every chance I get. Then the letters came. Letters from me. Letters from Christians all over the world. God not only answered my prayer for a Bible. He let me know I am not forgotten. That's a powerful video. Um, June is typically when we recognize our perse persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> and um, there was a couple of different videos I was looking at showing, but I felt like this one tied in directly with what we're going to be talking about today. I still got like a little bit of an echo. Um, we're going to start a series called Sayings That Are Not in the Bible. And I kind of just stumbled across um, 
this thought. Um, it's not an original thought from me. So, but there's a lot of things that we say that are we think are biblical. We say it and we think that we're, we're responding to scripture that's in the Bible. And the truth is we're not. There may be a hint of truth in what we're saying, some biblical truths. But the reality is, is that it's not in the Bible. But yet as Christians, we speak it as if it's the truth. It's the word of God. And today we're going to be talking about God wants me to be happy. So go do what makes you happy. I hear that all the time. God just wants you to be happy. Pastor, doesn't God just want me to be happy? So no matter what I do, God, it's going to be good. It's, it's going to be cool because, because, you know, God just wants me to be happy. Well, there is some truth in that. There, God does want us to experience happiness. But I don't think it's in the way that we, especially in the church today, describe it. Jesus didn't tell his disciples, go into all the world and preach whatever makes people happy. He didn't say that. He didn't say, whoever wants to be my disciple must affirm themselves, avoid the cross, and follow their own heart. It's not what he said. He never said, happy wife, happy life, right? He never said that. Yet, I use that one all the time. Hi, honey. <laughs> Ask, and it will be given, because your God is a celestial sugar daddy, right? Those are not things that Jesus said, man. Those are not things that are in the Bible. Jesus never said that you are going to be happy. He never said that. I don't think this dude in prison was exactly happy he was in prison. I don't think he was like, yeah, right? I mean, it broke his heart to go to his home and get these Bibles that his wife was smuggling to him so that he could take him into the prisoners. And, and he, was, he was like, man, it was, it, it was killing me. It was breaking my heart to have to leave my wife. But if I didn't, she would be in danger. So today I want to take a passage of Scripture that we are very familiar with and I want to tie it into what happiness really looks like in the kingdom of God. If you guys would open up your Bibles, please, to John chapter 8. It's a very familiar story to all of us. We're going to talk about the woman in adultery. We're going to start in verse 2. I'm reading out of the NIV this morning. It says that Don, he, this is Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, I don't know how these dudes caught her, right? I mean, to me, this sounds like a setup or, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, okay? But for whatever reason, they caught her in adultery, right? And now they're going to bring her before Jesus. It says they made her stand before the group, and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? And verse 6 says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So first off, their motive wasn't even pure in why they were bringing this woman here. Right? It wasn't pure. It says that they, they did this, they... they they were using this question as a way to trap him. So it was already a setup. We can see that it was a setup. Now, here's the thing. This was a very complicated situation. You need to understand this. According to the law of Moses, if she was caught in adultery, she was guilty, and she was to be taken out and stoned, right? And so if, if Jesus agrees with this, then there's a chance he's going to lose his reputation as a, as, a, as a loving rabbi. He was different than the other rabbis and teachers of that time. And if he lets her go, then he's condoning adultery. So it looks like he's in a, in a sticky situation. It's like a no-win situation. Ah, but you're dealing with God. You're dealing with Jesus. Verse, the, worst, uh, the rest of verse 6 says, but Jesus bent down. And started to write on the ground 
with his finger. So what did he write? There's been a lot of speculation. I was reading up on this, and, and it says that some of the later manuscripts says that he wrote the sins of his of accusers, and, and they're, they're using these Greek words of graphene, which means to write down, okay, and, and kata, which means against. So uh, the word here is kata graphene, which means to write down a record against you. Listen, I don't know what he wrote. If it was important, it would have been in Scripture. But whatever he was writing, it had an impact on them. It had a direct impact. See, I love God because God just gives me what I need to know. And I have to trust him for the rest. That's where faith comes in, right? Verse 7 says, when they kept on questioning him, Jesus, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, here's the interesting thing. God, in his infinite wisdom, knew what he was doing when the Bible was written in the certain languages, uh, the original language, Hebrew, Greek, even the Aramaic language, okay? These languages are so distinct in their wording. The Hebrew language has 226,000 words. The Greek language has just a little less. The English language, maybe 30,000 words. So when things were being written in the original language and then translated into English, there was sometimes there was a problem with how to translate or how to get the right tense or verse, or, or I should say verbiage. What Jesus is actually saying here, he's not saying without sin. He's saying without even wanting to sin. Think about that. It's not without sin. It's without even wanting to sin. Now, how many of us don't want to sin? Right? We, We don't want to, but we do. We do sin. This is a mindset. He's saying, look, if you shouldn't even want to sin, that's what I'm talking about here. It's like, church, it's so easy for us to see the sins of others, right? Man, we can point them out. You can point mine out. I know you guys can. We can point out each other's sin. Boy, we're good at it. We are so good at it. But we sure struggle with our sin, right? We don't like, we don't like to be called out on our stuff. But boy, we call each other. Or boy, I'm going to call you out. And it's crazy how sin works in our lives. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. Now, I'm going to be really transparent with you guys today. You may be uncomfortable with this, and I'm sorry. But, I mean, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Last week, right, I got stuck in a conversation out in public. And I'm like, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And your pastor acted like my phone vibrated in my pocket. And I took the phone out and acted like I had a phone call. I, I've got to get back to you. And I walked away. It was sin. <laughs> that was sin. Right? And I'm thinking, it's cool. I got things to do. I jump in my truck, and I'm like, what did I just do, Lord? Are you kidding me? Now, that may make, make you feel uncomfortable that I did something like that. I'm really sorry, but I never stand up in front of you and act like I'm anything more than what I am. I am a sinner saved by grace just like you. And today we're going to be challenged in our thinking today. Verse 8 says, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. He didn't say, go and do whatever makes you happy. Go now, follow your heart. Doesn't matter what you do, you be you, boo. It's all good. You just be you. No, 
He says here, go now. There's an urgency. The verb that's being used here, go, along with now. In the Greek, it means it's an urgency. And he's saying, leave your life of sin. Be different and be free. That's what he's telling her. See, here's the problem. We justify the things that we do and how we act all the time. All the time. She didn't say, well, golly, they, they tricked me, Lord. They tricked me, Jesus. She didn't say nothing. She just she answered his questions. And then when Jesus said, go and sin no more, she was free. See, some of y'all need to get free from this stuff this morning. You need to get free. Because here's the thing you need to understand. Temptation is around every corner. It's around every corner. Temptation is there all the time. Temptation is trying to get at us every minute of every day. And you know what? The reality is we all give in to temptation. I did. I got a phone call, man. Right? Instead of just being honest and saying, hey, man, I got to roll. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude to you, man, but I got to really go. I come up with some lame excuse. So why do we give in to temptation? Why do we give in to temptation to sin? I'm going to tell you why. It sounds fun. And it is fun. Sin is fun. Right? Think about your sin. Think about how much you enjoy it, how fun it is. But here's what you need to understand. Sin promises satisfaction. It does. At the cost of disobedience to God. Did you catch that? Sin promises satisfaction. You might have satisfaction for that moment or for a year or two years or ten years. I don't know. But here's the thing. It comes at the cost of being disobedient to God. That's huge. Now, some have suggested this woman was a prostitute. But Scripture doesn't tell us that. Scripture doesn't say she was a prostitute. It doesn't say anything about her. It says she was caught in adultery. Who knows how she got in this situation? I don't know. Maybe she was married and maybe this was an affair. Maybe she had a husband, right? And he, he treated her bad or he took her for granted or he was verbally abusive. You know, think about things, man. We, we take scripture and we, we come up with our own ideas. Well, she was a prostitute. It doesn't say that. The earliest manuscripts do not say that. And, and really, it, it could be no different than today for some of you out there. Some of you out there are on the brink of making one of the biggest, biggest mistakes you've ever made. You know? Fast forward it to, to 2021. Maybe, maybe she worked in an office. Right? And maybe there's this really nice guy, handsome looking dude, always giving her attention, complimenting her at work, likes her ideas, man. Hey, notices her hair when the husband doesn't. Innocent, seems innocent. Nothing's going on. There's nothing wrong. He's funny. He's thoughtful. It's all good. It's just an innocent relationship. Then he starts commenting on her social media, little hearts. Ooh, I love it. She finds herself thinking and looking forward to seeing him. Stays late at, at work. Op he opens up about his marriage. Wish he'd married someone like her. Oh, here it comes. He accidentally brushes against her. Or was it an accident? Was it an accident? Right? She realizes her emotions are out of control. This is wrong. I'm married. But it feels so right because he makes me feel so good. He's what's missing. He'd make me happy. She confides to her best friend, man, I'm, I'm struggling. I got this dude at work, man. He's all over me, man. And she says, follow your heart. Follow your heart. And step by step, things begin to happen until she's publicly barely dressed, humiliated and ashamed, and her sin is before the Lord. It can happen, church. If you don't have safeguards built into your lifestyle, your works, your activities, 
you can fall into sin. I'm sorry some of you think you can't. You're the most vulnerable. You are the most vulnerable if you think you can't. See, there's a problem in our culture today. And the problem is this. People approach life with a relativistic belief. They don't believe in absolute truth. What's true for you isn't necessarily true for me. You do you. You do what makes you happy. See, the world's idea of happiness is directly tied to circumstances. How many of you are like that? I'll I'll tell you. I know because I watch you. You watch me. Right? If our circumstances are favorable, then I'm all happy. It's all good. If my home life is good, then I'm happy. If it's bad, then I'm not happy. Church, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Without a belief in absolute truth, now listen to me, and this is where it's going to get real. Truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. This is in the church today. Read 1 Timothy chapter 3, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3. When the bottom line is my happiness, and that's how we're wired today, happiness becomes the standard by which I judge my actions. Did you catch that? That's the standard you're going to do. My happiness is what's the key. That's what's going to create in me to do the things that I'm doing. That's a scary place to be. Knowing it's wrong, but it feels so right, yikes. We're all guilty of it, man. Every single one of us in this room are guilty of this. So here's the problem. This is what I really believe the problem is in the church today. So many think that happiness and holiness are at odds. I'll say that again. So many think that happiness and holiness are at odds. You either choose the one or choose the other. If you choose holiness, it's over for you. You're destined to have a miserable existence, right? You're going to have to walk around with your Bible all day, and you're going to have to quote scripture, and, you know, you're going you're gonna to wear, uh, you know, pleated ch- pants, and you're going to look, you, you got to look your part, and you can listen to Amy Grant tapes. I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. Listen, let me tell you what God's word does not say. It does not say, for God so loved the world. He wants his children holy and miserable. He doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in Scripture. He's a loving father, okay? And let me tell you what he says, right, or what Jesus has to say about this in Matthew chapter 7, 11. He says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Do you understand there is nothing on earth that's that good? If it doesn't come from my father's hand, it's, not, it's worth nothing. Nothing. And here's the problem, church. Here's the problem. We're looking for happiness in the wrong place. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, some of you may, or may have read Max Lucado's book. In one of his books, I cannot remember the name of the book, but I remember the story. He talks about the fish on the beach. The fish on the beach. He says one day a fish is washed up on the beach. And it's laying there on the beach. And it's like, hey, I'm out of the water. Now, Max Lucado says, do you think the fish is happy? He's on the beach. Is he happy? Well, I want to make the fish happy. So if I bring the fish a pile of cash, is he going to be happy? Is he going to be like, Man, I can go to shoot Nordstrom, right? If I bring him a beach chair and sunglasses and start serving him margaritas and pina coladas and mai tais, is the fish going to be happy, right? If I bring, if I get some like girly fish and put them up all around him on the beach, like some you know bomb looking you know blowfish or goldfish, I don't know you know, but if I put him up there with the man, is is he going to be like? No. Why? Because he'll never be happy on the beach because he wasn't designed for the beach. He will never be happy on the beach. He's got to be in the water. Church, let me tell you something. You are not made for the earth that we are on today. In the garden, that's different. 
But we are in a sin-laden, sin-fallen, destructive earth environment. We were never made for this. We are holy and set apart for God. But we live like the earth is everything. Listen, we need to lower your, our expectations of earth, right? That's what we need to do and raise our expectations of heaven. You were created by God for God. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Okay. But what do we do? If we were created by God for God, what do we do? We pursue the things of the world. I'm telling you, we all do. Don't sit there and be like, not me, Pastor. I'm not like that. I bet you you are. Let me see your checkbook. Let me see your bank account. I'll tell you what you're spending your money on. Listen, nothing the world has to offer will bring you true joy. I'll say that again. Nothing the world has to offer will bring you true joy. No new car. No new boat. No new boo, right? Not an exotic vacation. Not a million likes on your Instagram. Not all the money in the world. Not your hair. Some of us don't have any. I see that one right there. You like me. Your body. I know you all want to be skinny like me, right? Not the new pair of shoes. Not self-esteem. None of that will give joy to your heart in any way. Your heart craves something different. Deep down it craves something. That's why you're never satisfied. That's why you go out and you buy your new car and six months later you want to buy another one. Right? That's why you, you buy your dream home and in five years it's not big enough. Right? That's why, man, I'm going on the vacation of the lifetime and you go here and then two years later you're like, oh, that, I got to go here because this is better. We're never satisfied by the things of the world, church. Only God can satisfy us. Only God. Listen, holiness isn't mutually exclusive of happiness. Holiness is the pathway to true happiness and joy. What do you mean, holiness? Holier than thou. What are you talking about? Psalm 1611 says this. You will make known to me. Listen to this. This is such a dope verse. You will make known to me the path of life. God will make known to you the path of life. Some of you think you're following the path of life that God has for you, and you're not. You're, you've been duped. In your presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Are you kidding me? In God's right hand are pleasures forevermore for you and I. We don't live it. We don't believe it. I was putting this together, and I, I was thinking about, like, just my life and how I, I honor God and don't honor God, right? How temptation grabs me and, and, and how at other times I can run away from temptation. Now, I had asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior when I was 11 years old. I'll never forget it. I used to ride a church bus every Sunday, right, because my parents, although they were they weren't religious. They wanted me to be, I guess, right? So they'd throw me on this church bus every Sunday morning. Nine o'clock, they'd pick me up. Brrr, we'd be singing these little church songs, you know. Oh, hey, we're all happy. Yay. So we'd go to church, and i hear the gospel message, man. And it resonated in my spirit because a lot of you know my story. I was, I was miserable. I was a miserable kid. Even at 11 years old, I was in a very, very dysfunctional family. It was terrible. And so I come into this relationship with Jesus. But here's the thing. I hear about this life-giving message in Jesus, but there's something inside of me, and I'm thinking, man, I can never live up to Jesus' standard. I, I can never live up to all the rules and regulation that come with being a Christian because the church that I got saved in, man, I'm telling you what, you towed the line, right? My life was miserable anyway, and the thought of following Christ it actually made it that much worse. I'm thinking, there's just no way I can do this. There's no way I can be happy. Within three months of becoming a Christian or asking Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I'm not going to say I was saved. Maybe I was, maybe I wasn't. It's God's business. 
I started drinking. I went with my buddy's parents and him up to a lake. And they were partiers. I mean, they were, the, they were the cool parents, man. They were smoking weed and all that stuff back in the day, boy. They were the cool parents. And so we were raiding their little uh, cooler and, and stealing beers. And, man, you know, we're 11 years old, three or four beers in. We're drunk as a skunk, man. We're like, wow, you know. It wasn't long after that I got introduced to weed. My cross-the-street neighbor who was old to me, man, he said, hey, man, you want to you try this? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll try it, you know. Start smoking before I knew it, man, I was going into a lifestyle that by the time I was 14 years old, there wasn't, there wasn't too much stuff I hadn't tried. Because I'm going to tell you something. I loved getting drunk and getting high. I loved it. And the reason I did is it took away the pain, and it made me feel good, and it made me feel alive. Started using cocaine when I was 15. Started making a lot of money on the streets. And so I started using cocaine. It was the drug of choice back in the late 70s, early 80s, man. I mean, if you were anybody, you did cocaine. I would literally try anything to get high. I huffed paint. I didn't matter. The only thing I never tried, I, I was too afraid, was to try heroin. I just, for whatever reason, I just could never try it. And I kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And I kept doing things that were more shameful and more harmful to me and to others. And I did all this before the age of 18. All of this was before the age of 18. I was in a vicious cycle that I could not stop. It was part of who I was. Some of you are there right now. Some of you are in a vicious cycle that you cannot seem to get out of. You can't stop overspending. Every time you swipe that card, man, you feel good. Every time you get that new item, man, it's, it gives you an, a, a rush. I know people that get a rush from shopping. You can't stop smoking. Right? You want to. You want to quit, but you can't. You're stuck. Drinking. Man, you're, you're, you're drinking every day. Every day you're getting, you're, you're drunk. You're hooked on prescription pills. You're stuck in a lust-filled porn world. You can't stop clicking. You're in the wrong type of relationships, man. Your relationships aren't good. You're clicked up with people, man, that are going to take you in the wrong direction. Now, I'm not talking about I have plenty of unsaved friends that I connect with all the time, but I have a mission in what I'm doing. You're in a vicious cycle, man. You don't know how to get out. Like I said before, sin promises satisfaction at the cost of disobedience to God. But here's the beautiful thing, church. Here's the beautiful thing. There's a verse in the Bible that is so refreshing. It is so freeing. And I'm going to read it to you. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Do you understand this? That whatever you're facing is common, Right? Now, we all have our pet sins that we're like, oh, well, I can't, that per, I can't be around that person because they're doing that or they're doing this. Let me tell you something. You're capable of anything. Just be put in the right situation. You can do it. The love of Christ constrains me. Then Paul writes, and God is faithful. God is faithful. That's what we forget. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. He will give you a way out. Now, this verse has been misconstrued and said that God will not give you more than you can handle. Unbiblical, it's not there. That's not, that's not what this verse is telling you. God will give you more than you can handle. That way you have to rely on him. This verse is talking about when sin is knocking at your door, when temptation is there, God will give you a way out. It says he will provide it. God will provide it. With the woman in adultery, Jesus' grace was the way out of adultery for the woman. It was his grace. I condemn you neither. It was his grace. He was God. He had every right to bring judgment upon her. But grace was the ingredient that was used in her life. 
how much grace do you and I have for each other? We have little or none. God will provide the escape, church, if we rely on God. It's like, it's like video games, right? I was thinking about this. It's kind of funny, right? But video games. And there's a lot of popular video games today, right? There's like Call of Duty, uh, Minecraft, uh, Fortnite, Assassin's Creed. I had to look them up. I didn't. The only one I knew was Call of Duty. So, <laughs> but, but I guess these are like some of the most popular games, right? And here's the, here's the thing about these games. They all put you in tempting situations where you're going to take risks. And in those risks, you're going to make a mistake and you're going to pay the price. It's like when I would watch my boys play Call of Duty. I'm watching them going, man, why are you going in that room? They go in, boom, they're dead, right? And then the next thing you know, they, whoop, they're back alive again, right? I mean, it's just, it's nuts, right? But they put you in these tempting situations, and you make these mistakes. And some of these, some of these are pretty graphic. I mean, I'm like, yikes, I don't know about these. But anyways, so but I grew up in a more God-honoring time of video games. We had Frogger and Donkey Kong and, you know. Pac-Man, Asteroids, you know, right? Remember Hyperspace and Asteroids? Are any of you old enough to remember that? Man, I am, boy. Asteroids was my favorite, was my favorite one, right? Me and my boys would sit around and drink and, and get high, and we'd play Asteroids all night. I mean, what a weird mindset that is, right? But, dude, I loved Hyperspace. Because hyperspace, man, I'd be getting ready to get bombarded, man, like all these little asteroids are coming, and I could hit the little button. Thank goodness for the button, right? <coughs> it's like, whoop, you know, and I'd disappear. And whoo, I'd be over on the other side of the screen, and I wouldn't get in touch. I was like, yeah, right? Hyperspace. Well, man, listen to me, right? Thank goodness for hyperspace and asteroids. Well, I got something, some news for you today. Thank God for hyper grace when it comes to the, it comes to the kingdom of God. He gives us hyper grace. Do you understand that every one of us should be dead for the things we've done? Well, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. Break one part of the law. That's what the word says. Listen, when you find yourself trapped, when you find yourself in a situation, and you're like, man, where do I go? How do I get out of this? Let me tell you something. Every temptation... Every situation is an invitation to depend on Jesus. It's an invitation to depend on Jesus. But we don't. We try to work it out on our own, and we blow it. Jesus told the woman, go now and sin no more. There was an urgency in what he said. And you know what? I believe this, and I could be reading in the scripture, and that's okay. Right? Shame on me. But I believe she left full of hope. I believe she did. I believe she left full of hope. And isn't that what we all long for this morning is hope? Listen, we need to stop living in fear of what's bad and start longing for what's good. We have to shift our perspective. We need to do a paradigm shift. Stop worrying about what's bad. Well, if I do this, this is bad. Start longing for, man, if I do this, this is good. I remember the day that I got off of drugs. It was a painful day. I had been on a three-day party binge. All up and down the East Bay. And I came home. And I was going to rest. And then I was going to hook back up with some, some of my buddies and head back down to the Bay again. But something happened to my body. I overdosed. I went to take a shower, and the next thing I knew, I woke up, and the, I was just laying in, in the bathtub, just water pouring on me. And I'm thinking, something's wrong. Something's not right here. I, 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 this is not good. And I remember getting up, and I could, I could barely function. I could barely move. And all I knew to do was go to my mom's because I knew that my mom would do what I asked her to do. And so I don't even remember driving there. To this day, I still don't remember it. But I remember when I walked into my mother's room, and she looked at me, she screamed, and she said, oh, my gosh, what's wrong with you? I don't know. I must have looked terrible. I said, Mom, I said, I had, I've had too much. I said, there's too much in my system, man. I'm ODing. I said, listen, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay here. 
I said, if I stop breathing, call an ambulance. But I'm going to try to ride this one out. And so I'm riding it out. And I'm laying there. And I'm crying out to God. Isn't that what we do? We cry out to God when we're in trouble, even when we're not. I know people don't love Jesus or believe in God, but they sure have a problem. They pray. Can you pray for me, Pastor? Right? Here's the crazy thing. I'm laying there. And I'm crying out to God. And I realize at that moment, that very moment in time, that Jesus had always been there. He had always been there. He had been there since I was 11 years old. And during all those seasons of drugs and abusing my body and doing the things that I'm ashamed of today, there had been a power in me that was ready to overpower me, to lead me out of the life that I had been in. And my first steps back to Jesus started that day. And that's when that which held me as a prisoner held me no more held me no more. The temptation to do drugs and, and to, to get high and do those things suddenly weren't there anymore. And you know why? Because for the first time, I took the way out, the way out. Here's the thing. Every temptation is an invitation to pin my pride. And let me tell you something. I wasn't remorseful. I was repentant. I remember when I started coming to my senses and coming out of the, the stupor that I'd been in, for lack of a better word, that I began to ask forgiveness of what I had been doing. I wasn't remorseful. See, there's a difference between being remorseful and having repentance. Remorse is I got caught. And I'm so sorry I got caught, but I got caught. Right? Repentance is something entirely different. Re. It means to turn. That's what re means. It means to turn. Pent. The word pent is that which is high. It's like, it's like uh, uh, going to the penthouse. Okay? It's to turn from the lower things of the world to the higher things of God. That's what repent means. Go be free and sin no more. It's all about the re. Some of you, you need to return to God because you're not there. You're fooling yourselves and you think that you are, but you're not there. You need to return. Church, he's calling you this morning. He's saying, come back to me, man. Come on. As a pastor, um, I follow different pastors and, and I love to listen to things they say. And this one pastor that I just love, he looked up re words, right? Words that start with R-E. It's pretty good. <laughs> and, and he came up with this sentence that I just love or saying whatever you want to say. He says, if you rebuke the enemy and return to God by repenting of your sin and receiving Christ, your spirit will be reborn, your mind renewed, your life rebuilt. You will be reconciled by Christ's redeeming work and reap the rewards of relationship causing revival to break through. I was asked, how do you know when a church is dying? Right? Right? And, I, and, and the answer is when the, when the people are dead. That's how you know a church is dying. Right? You, listen, you and I bring into this house what we want to bring into it every Sunday. Now, I know some people are uncomfortable with the way I worship. I raise my hands, I sway, I move and all that. I don't care. I love Jesus and it just that's how I worship. You're, being, you're, you're not honoring the Lord. Really? Tell that to King David when he was half naked dancing around the, the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant when it was being brought into Jerusalem. His wife rebuked him, and guess what happened to her? She couldn't have no kids. God said, really? Don't touch my anointed. He is praising and worshiping me. I don't care how you praise and worship. It's what's in your heart. But you bring into the house of the Lord what you bring into the house of the Lord, man. 
Revival happens when people's hearts are revived by the Holy Spirit. That's when revival happens. And isn't that what this is all about? This is all about our our hearts being revived to who Jesus is so we can do the work of the Lord and go reap the harvest. Listen, God does want you to be happy, church, but that can only come from a relationship with him through Jesus. Go and sin no more. Those are the words that Christ has for us this morning. Father, thank you for this this message that forced me to look at my life and I pray it's it's touched others, Lord. I know that we all love you, God, and we want to be in a relationship with you, but Lord, we just need to stop making excuses for the way we act, man. You tell us to go and sin no more. You want us free, but when we continue in our sinful attitudes, our sinful thoughts, our sinful actions, Lord, well, then we're stuck in sin. And that's not what God has for us. Church, he doesn't have that for us. So, Lord, I just pray that today would be the day of new beginnings. That today would be the day when we decide, Lord, that we want to truly be set free. That we are going to truly repent of the nonsense we've been doing. And, Lord, we're going to let your spirit Renew us in ways we never thought possible. Thank you, God, for your love and grace, Lord. Thank you that we're under grace and not under judgment. And, Lord, we're just uh, so hopeful in in this season, Lord, when it seems hopeless, that uh, you will just do a mighty work in your people so that we can in turn do a mighty work that glorifies you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.